all hospitals try and reduce stress. But this particular hospital calls on the services of a very special expert to do that. Someone with lots of blonde hair, bad breath and a wet nose. Meet Golden Retriever Nala. She's worked as a pet therapy dog for 14 years and is known at this hospital as Dr Dog. <coughs> Animal therapy dogs like Nala need to be calm, obedient and really intelligent. Not any old mutt can make the cut. Two of Nala's biggest fans are Spike and his sister Poppy. Spike has been in and out of hospital for most of his life. He and Nala have become good friends. What's your favourite bit of Nala to stroke? I've got two. Go for it. My, her ears and her tummy. And her tummy. How does it make you feel when you see Nala? Poppy, how do you feel? Because you come into hospital a lot to see your younger brother. Yeah, I think Nala helps you relax. Nala, do you feel happy when you see Spike? Yes! <laughs> Nala makes new friends every day. Harvey has just popped in for a checkup. While you've been with Nala, have you been agonising about your appointment? I've just been thinking about the dog, really. <laughs> Dogs are, like, really cuddly and they just look really cute. Once you've petted her, we ask everyone to spray their hands. Nala has a bottle of germ-busting gel attached to her collar. Do you know why that's important? You might get germs if you put your hand in your mouth. So you've got to wash your hands. That is exactly right. There's no doubt that this professional pooch can put a smile on your face, but can Nala really have a physical effect on a patient's health? Well, let's put Dr Dog to the test. To help me, here's Miracle, who's in hospital having kidney dialysis treatment. Can you explain to me how it all works? The machine can clean my blood. So the machine is taking the place of your kidneys, is that right? Mm -hmm. So what I want to do is, while you're having your dialysis, I want to measure your blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to bring in Nana the dog, mm -hmm. and we're going to see what happens to your blood pressure. Mm -hmm. A blood pressure test is a simple way to check if a patient is stressed. Being stressed out can lead to high blood pressure, okay. which means that your heart is under extra strain. It's a miracle. At the moment, your blood pressure is 116 over 67. Those numbers mean Miracle's blood pressure is already within the normal range. But let's see if Nala can make Miracle even more relaxed. After a few minutes of stroking our happy hound, we take Miracle's blood pressure again. So, Miracle, your, your blood pressure has gone from 116 over 67 to 105 over 59. So although it's still within the normal range, her blood pressure has gone down, meaning Miracle is more relaxed and less stressed. The science is clear. Not only does Nala make people smile, she also physically improves a patient's health. For me, that is totally amazing that we can bring an animal in and just through affecting Miracle's mood, we can have a really big effect. Now, stress over a long time can be bad for your body, but dogs like Nala are amazing at relieving it. So every single person she's met today, including me, has had a little boost. I feel very relaxed. Thank you, Nala. Your body is amazing, but sometimes it needs fixing. All over the UK, there are special teams of professionals trained to tackle medical mysteries. There are around 25,000 blind or partially sighted kids in the UK. Now, there are lots of different ways of being partially sighted. Some kids will have a part of their vision missing entirely. That's called a blind spot. For other kids, their vision will look fuzzy or out of focus. This can make everyday activities, such as texting or walking down the street, less simple than they seem. I've come to meet 10-year-old Ryan. Hi, Dr. Nicholas. Come in. Thank you. Ryan is partially sighted. Everything looks blurry to him, and it's worst in his right eye. Now, because you've got so much less vision in that eye, yep. do you find what we call depth perception difficult? Um, yes, I actually have none. Depth perception allows you to judge how far away things are. Can you get your fingers in front of your eyes and put them together like that? No. You can try that at home. Try and bring your fingers together and touch them. You need both eyes working together. If I close my eye, it's much, much harder. Lack of depth perception makes everyday activities a bit more difficult. Luckily for Ryan, there are people like Sharon from the charity Blind Children UK to help. Has Sharon been helpful for you? Yes. 
What's she been showing you? How to cross roads and um, how to cook and make drinks. Brian's carrying a cane to let other people know that he's partially sighted. And he uses parked vehicles as they offer some protection whilst allowing him to take up a good seeing and hearing position on the road. You want to show me how to cross the road? OK. Well, first, feel if the engine's on or okay. off. So we make sure it's off and we stand at the front so if the driver is in it, he'll see us. Yep. And so if he reverses, we won't get flattened to either. Right. So this is all about not getting flattened. Yes. No flattening. Now we're going to use our hand to trail along yep. to the edge of the car. Mm -hmm. Step down. Good. So now what do we do, Ryan? We are going to look and listen for a car. So what do you think? Are we safe to cross? No. Aren't we? No. Oh, look at that. Ryan's completely right. I would have crossed the road. Ryan just heard a car before I did that I would have just walked out in front of. How about now? Are we safe to cross? Yes. Off we go. Ryan relies on his hearing as compensation for his lack of vision. Great job. Thank what a you. high five. Life saved. Chris, would you like to know what it's like to just use your hearing? Yeah, I would. <laughs> oh, and I must. Thank you very much. Of course, I'm not actually going to cross the road, as that would be dangerous. Also, Ryan is very used to his condition, so I reckon I'm at a disadvantage here. Where is, where is the car? Oh, here we go, OK, I got the car. So I can definitely hear a car now. Oh, I absolutely cannot tell. What's the car coming toward us? What's that car going away? I would say it is now safe to cross. It is, is safe to cross. It is safe to cross, yes, OK. Yeah. I have to say, I do not feel confident, even with you and Ryan advising me. There are other practical things that can help Ryan be more independent as well, like gadgets. So, Ryan, what are we doing here? Learning how to um, use a liquid level indicator. A liquid level indicator? As the water gets near the rim, the emitter lets off a beep to let Ryan know the glass is almost full. Oh, hello. The indicator then makes a second faster beep when the liquid reaches the top of the glass, and that's useful for adding squash. Here. Oh, wow, now we're really about to spill. <laughs> is this your kind of music? Yeah. That is literally the worst dance tune I've ever heard. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to forget how much we use our eyes for even the smallest things. And for blind or partially sighted kids like Ryan, these little things can be really tricky. Luckily, with gadgets and special mobility training, Ryan can get on with the more important things in life, like dancing to the sound of his liquid level indicator. <laughs> Do this. Feel your own head. It's the easiest way of getting a sense of what your skull is like. But wouldn't it be better if you could actually see it? Well, today, I'm going to do just that. I'm about to come face to face with my own skull. First stop, an MRI scanner. It takes pictures of your body, including your tissue, blood vessels, organs, and most importantly today, my bones. The MRI takes thousands of images. It's almost like slicing the skull and taking a picture of each slice. On here, I've got loads of pictures of my head. And we're going to do something that until recently would have seemed like science fiction. That's right. I'm going to print my skull. This is a 3D printer. It's not like a normal printer with ink and paper. This prints things you can pick up and use. But one of the most amazing things it can do is print replacement body parts. And to prove it, I'm going to print an exact copy of my skull. My MRI scan images are sent to this printer, which then prints each slice of my skull as a thin layer of blue glue in this bed of powder until the complete skull is created. In charge of 3D printing at Nottingham University is Dr Glenn Kirkham. So that's your skull. Now they've printed the skull in blue, just for me. It's very, very creepy, actually. If I do that, it's exactly like scratching my own head. He may not look a lot like me, but in fact, the shape of your skull enormously influences the way you look, because no 
two skulls are alike. Your skull is the only one of its kind in the world. And did you know you have a hole in the back of your head as well? That? Yeah. Is so. that just a glitch with the printer? No, you have a little hole in the back of your head. What's a bit odd is I can feel it with this finger on the printed skull, and I can feel exactly the same little hole with this finger on my real skull. That's not right. The 3D printing isn't just fun, it's got a real medical use. Scientists are now 3D printing more complex bits of the body. Even something that seems simple, like your nose, has a bony bit at the top and then soft tissue at the bottom. And the latest 3D printers can do both. Meet the mind-blowing, megatastic master of 3D printing. What makes this incredible piece of technology different to the one that printed my skull is that it not only prints hard bones using a special plastic and powder, it also prints soft tissue using a gel filled with live cells, which could become real working organs. But to do that, the printer needs to know which order to put the cells in. So if you want to print a heart, then you need to get the billions of cells in your body into the right order to make a heart. And if you want to make a kidney, then all the cells need to be put in a different order. The way scientists do this is by moving the cells on a computer tablet. This is our digital tweezer system. So this lets us grab individual cells and move them around wherever we want them to go. So unbelievably, my finger is moving cells that are under a microscope in another building. That is awesome. The possibilities with 3D printing are limitless, even within your lifetime. It might be possible that if you damage a bit of your body, you can simply print you another one. Now, isn't that amazing? I think I'd look better in green, though, Chris. It's time for Investigation Ouch, and welcome to Manchester City Centre. Have you ever wondered what all this activity does to the air you breathe in? Well, I'm about to find out. When you breathe in air, your lungs transfer the oxygen to your blood to keep your body going. But your lungs also have to work hard to keep pollution out. To do that, they need mucus and snot. And that's why for my investigation... I'm going to need some snot. I'll be collecting snot from the city and the seaside to see what these two different environments throw at our lungs every time we breathe in. Again. <laughs> First up, the city. We want a sample of your snot. What? <laughs> you want my boogies? That's just weird! Oh, there's a couple of nice ones on there. Well, that's the city sorted, but what about if you live by the sea? I'm now at Western Supermare. Could we get a sample of your snot? <laughs> oh, yeah! Do we have to? Yeah! <laughs> that's a good haul, actually. <laughs> Finn, this was going to be your breakfast, wasn't it? Now, we, now we're going to take it back to the lab. So now I've got a load of snot, let's see what's in it. There you are. Meet Dr Kelly Barube. She's an expert on air pollution at Cardiff University, and I've got a challenge for her. So, Kelly, I have taken nasal swabs from the city and from the seaside. OK. Now I want you to tell me which is which. It's not going to be a problem, Chris. Easy peasy. Really? Yeah. Kelly's putting each sample under her microscope to see what's in it and work out where it's from. This sample is going into seaside pile. I'm saying that that's going to be city. Let's have a count up and see how she did. That's correct. Correct. That's correct. 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 How were you able to do that so easily? Well, I started off with the fact that um, cities have more pollution. The ones that had the more soot on them, I put them in the city pile. The ones that didn't, I put them on the seaside. You've got snot up your nose and liquidy mucus all the way down your airways into your lungs, where they trap pollution particles. And this is where mucus is brilliant. It actually helps your body get rid of those particles. But if it's bombarded with too much pollution, it can't cope, as we're going to show you. This is a scanning electron microscope. It's one of the most powerful microscopes in the world, and to replace it would cost almost a million pounds. It's expensive because it can magnify up to two million times more than a normal microscope. Each of these metal tubes contains little samples of lung tissue, and you're about to see them close up on this awesome bit of kit. Kelly, what, 
what are we looking at here? What's this? Uh, this is the surface of the lung, and we have these cilia. These are little hairs, and they move mucus and debris out. So basically, all the way through the air tubes, from our nose down into our lungs, we have these what look like hairs, and they move in time and shift mucus that's trapped stuff we don't want in our lungs yes. back up out so we can cough it out or spit yeah, it. clean or, our lungs so we can breathe better. Or pick it. Yes. So, that was a healthy lung, but this is an extremely diseased lung. This person has been breathing in dirty industrial air 24-7 over a very long period of time. The cilia are destroyed, and that's a particle of diesel. Remember we saw the, the, um, the cilia? Well, here, they've all collapsed. So it looks like like almost a, a field of grass where all the blades of grass have been flattened. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely, yes. So yep. if those cilia are flattened, they can no longer move the mucus nope. back up yep, nope. and you can get rid of yeah. stuff. Yeah, so now that stuff is stuck in there. But that was a lung under extreme dirty conditions. So although the air from our cities is more polluted than the air by the seaside, you shouldn't worry too much because the mucus in your lungs traps the pollution. It then gets wafted up by the cilia in our airways and you can cough it up or blow it out your nose. Proving your body is brilliant at cleaning its airways and that's whether you live by the sea or in the city. Ouch. Being scared, you might love it or you might hate it, but whichever it is, big changes happen with your body. And I'm going to show you what those changes are by riding one of Britain's scariest roller coasters. Roller coasters are exciting. Sometimes we scream, sometimes we puke. So why do we keep going on them? We've evolved over millions of years to either fight dangerous things or run away from them. And it's the reward that our brain gives us when we survive something that feels dangerous that keeps us coming back for more. I'm taking on a terrifying ride at Alton Towers to see how my body deals with fear. So I'm going to be wearing this sensor, which is going to be measuring my heart rate, my heart rhythm, my breathing rate, loads of different stuff that is going to be telling me what's happening with my body and measuring essentially how frightened I am. OK, that's my heart rate there. At the moment, it's a normal resting heartbeat. Keep an eye on it. Let's see what happens when I take on this scary ride. Now, very quickly, my body has started to feel fear. And when you're scared, your heart rate rises. Look at my beats per minute. They're going up rapidly. That's because my body has started to release adrenaline, a hormone that prepares you to deal with a dangerous situation. Adrenaline comes from the adrenal glands at the top of your kidneys. It tells your liver to release more glucose to your muscles, to give them energy and make sure you're charged up and ready to face your fear. <laughs> that was completely terrifying. My heart rate's very high, but as I finish the ride, it goes up even further. Let's find out why. As the ride starts, my heart rate remains fairly flat because I basically don't think the roller coasters are all that frightening. But the ride is so cleverly designed that I become completely convinced my legs are going to be chopped off and I'm definitely going to die. That's when my heart rate almost doubles and I'm totally terrified. My body is responding in exactly the same way it would if I was being attacked, and that is the fear response. But here's the thing. At the end of the ride, this point here, my heart rate goes up another 10 beats. And that's because I'm so happy I survived the dangerous situation. That's the reason we love these scary rides. Because once you've survived it, you get that feeling of extreme happiness and a spike of adrenaline, and that's what makes your heart go faster at the end. So what happens to your body when you go through the same scary experience a second time? I'm going to go on the ride again. So with frightening situations, you can either make it worse and get more frightened every time it happens, or you can learn that actually nothing bad's going to happen to me on a roller coaster. I didn't die last time, so this time I'm going to control my fear and be less frightened. This is the beginning bit where my heart rate previously was very normal, and this time it is a bit exciting. On this second ride, my heart rate isn't jumping up as quickly as the first ride. And that's because I know what to expect, and therefore, my fear response is not as dramatic. Now I've learned that nothing bad happens, I can really control that fear all the way through it. And you can do that with exams, you can do that with films, you can do it with anything you find frightening. You can just realise that actually, very few things are really dangerous and you can stop being frightened. If you're not frightened, you can keep your head together. 
So during the second ride, my heart rate only goes up to 112, during the most exciting bit of the ride. And at the end of the ride, I don't get that extra bump in heart rate. And I didn't feel that amazing euphoric sense of I've survived something really dangerous. And that's the thing I'm now craving. Luckily, there are loads more rides.